From Phoenix, Arizona, The Cube at Catalyst Conference. Here's your host, Jeff Frick. Hi, Jeff Frick here with The Cube. We are in Phoenix, Arizona at the Girls Who Code Catalyst Conference. It's a great show, about 400 people, their fourth year, is going back to the Bay Area next year. So we want to come down, talk to some of the keynotes, some of the speakers, and, and really give you a taste, if you weren't able to make the trip to Phoenix this year, of what's going on. So we're really excited to be joined by our next guest, Fran Meyer. She co-founded Match. She co-founded Trustee, serial entrepreneur, uh, startup veteran. Fran, welcome. Thank you so much, Jeff. Great to be here. Absolutely. So you are given a presentation on um, really what it is to be a woman entrepreneur. Yeah, so I've been an internet entrepreneur for now more than 20 years, going back to when we started Match.com. And I joined that in late 1994. We really launched around 1995, about 21 years ago this month, April in 1995. Flies. And many of the things that... Um, there, we're still very much, I think, in the early years of um, the impact of the internet and mobile and cloud and connectivity on our lives. And But Match.com has proven to be uh, what they call a unicorn, a very successful new business model. But more than that, many, many people have found their life partner or at least a few good dates <laughs> on Match.com. So I'm always very happy about that. And you're way ahead of the curve. Now, um, I think... I don't know, I've been married for, for over 20 years, but I think a lot of people, that's kind of the, the first way to yeah. meet people, not the second way, where when you guys first did Match.com, that was a pretty novel idea. Well, well, now they call dating, where, like we used to do it, where you met people at parties and bars. Now that's called dating in the wild. In the wild. <laughs> so the more <laughs> natural thing is using Match.com. But from an entrepreneurial support, I was one of the only women... Uh, who was involved in starting a company in the, in the mid-1990s. Um, still, women are less than 10% of uh, tech founders or venture-backed founders. Women raise a lot less money. Uh, and so one of my passions and why I'm here at Girls in Tech is to try and impart some of the wisdom gleaned over 20-plus uh, years. So what are some of the ways that you see that barrier starting to, to break down? Is it, is it just, you just got to keep banging on it and slowly, slowly it'll so move? I, is there I, any... I think there's been some, some difference. I think it's a lot easier to be an entrepreneur of any kind now well, than true. it was 20 years ago. I mean, now having uh, uh, meals delivered to you and the, the sort of support like girls in tech there was very little of that guidance, or certainly there were very few role models right. 20 years ago. So that certainly has changed. I think another big change, and this is probably over the last two or three years, is that now women feel they can speak out loud about some of the issues, and that there is some res uh, men are, are willing to listen, at right. least some are. Right. We still see things like... Um, TechCrunch a couple of years ago had a team present a new mobile app called Titstare. We still think, hear about things like that. We still, uh, there was a survey called The Elephant in Silicon Valley that itemized stories and stats about women and sexual abuse, other kinds of harassment, exclusion, not being invited to sit at the table. So a lot of that stuff is still going on. But I feel like we can call it out a little bit easier. Right, right. And it's, without retribution, potentially. Is there, is there kind of a, a tipping point, event, um, action that you see potentially is, to, is kind of accelerating? Well, accelerating you know, I, I think the media, since Lean In, has really kind of picked up on this and is covering it. And um, the Ellen Powell trial last year, I spoke a little bit about that, where uh, she brought suit to Kleiner Perkins. She lost the suit, but it started the dialogue. Right. So I think that a lot of this is, is, is happening. And my approach is to try and continue. I, I see, I advise so many startups, and I see business plans, and almost invariably, the business plans from women do, aren't big enough. They don't say, hey, we're going to be a $100 million company in five years, and we need to raise $5 million to get there. Right. Women play it more safe, and 
I don't think that, I'm trying to encourage them to take more risks, to figure out how to do it, to, to play to win. Right. Play big to win, right? Uh, play, swing, play swing big, big to win. Yeah, swing big. It's interesting that on the lean in, you know, Sheryl Sandberg's uh, kind of, I don't know, groundbreaking is the right word, but certainly groundbreaking certainly, book. Yeah. Um, but uh, the Golden State Warriors right now, probably the most popular professional sports team in the, in the country at the zenith of their success, they have a lean in commercial. I don't know if you've seen it in I the Bay Area seen where it. all of the players talk about leaning in. And it just so happens that Steph Curry, their number one, Superstar sure. is very close to his wife. She has a cooking show. They, they're very family oriented. Uh, uh, Green, I thought you Draymond were Green as his mom, who, who he just constantly just gushes about his mom. And so they, they as, the, as a male sports team, had a whole uh, commercial that they run quite frequently on specifically Lean In. Well, I, I appreciate that. I also, though, read the article that. Uh, uh, that team is owned by a bunch of venture capitalists and they all get together and play basketball and it reminded me of a little bit of another place where women have been excluded and so I was talking to a venture capital friend of mine saying buy into the Warriors or, or let's buy into a women's soccer team and you know at sports being what they are it's, it's almost a different thing but uh, the news about the women's soccer players being paid much less than the men, even though they generate more income. It's just another example, profession by profession, where women are paid less or have less opportunity to advance. But to, but to your point, I, I, I think people understand it. It's not right, but I think everyone pretty much knows that women aren't paid the same as men. But what I thought was interesting about the soccer story, to your point, is it was brought up. And yeah, there wasn't a retribution, it. right? It's like, hey... You know, we're not getting paid, and they, they listed the numbers in Sports Illustrated. They were dramatically different. And in fact, you know, one of the knocks on the WNBA uh, is that you can't make a living as a player in the WNBA. You just can't. They pay them like, I don't know, so they should have been, $60,000, yeah. whatever it is. You know, they have to go play at other places, um, foreign countries, to make enough money to, to live. So I, I, I do think it's interesting, your point, that... You know, the exposure of the, of the problem, the kind of acceptance that we need to do something about it does seem to be in a much better place than it used to be. The other thing that, that I think that these things illustrate is one of the messages I try and get across is women tend to settle for too little. You know, they, they don't necessarily negotiate for themselves. They, out of college, they do, don't do as well. They, I've talked to many women who they felt that when they were raising capital, or negotiating deals that the men on the other side of the table, mostly, not always, of course, it sort of said, hey, this is, this is great. You should be happy to get this. How many women get this? And that's not really the issue. The issue should be you should be getting what you deserve. I learned that the hard way. We talked about it a little bit a while ago, where um, Match.com was sold in 1998 for less than $10 million. And I was the general manager. I had grown it. We were number one. We were cash flow positive, although we probably shouldn't have been. And I walked away with $100,000. And at the time, sure, that's a lot of money, but nobody seemed to encourage me that I probably could have raised the money and led the investment and had an equity round. A year later, Match.com was sold from Send It to IAC for $70 million. And of course, I didn't get anything. Yeah. So that's my big lesson. The good news is 10 years later, I took Trustee, which was a nonprofit, switched it to a for-profit. I raised the capital and, and got my ownership and equity position. But tough lesson. Yeah, yeah, expensive one. Yeah. But those are the ones you learned, though. <laughs> I could go through a few of those, too. So, so Fran, we're, we're running low on, on time. I want to give you the last word and get your perspective on kind of mentorship and sponsorship. We hear those words tossed around a lot um, and that there's a significant difference between just being a mentor and actually being a sponsor, taking an active role in someone else's career, pushing them to maybe uncomfortable places, giving them, you know, kind of the oomph, if you will, that, yes, you can do this. Uh, you do belong. What are you seeing kind of the development of that as people try to help more women ascend kind of up the line? Well, you know, I tend to think of mentorship as something that happens within a company. And sponsorship can happen within a company, but advising, sponsoring, promoting, championing are things that, that we certainly need to do uh, within the entrepreneurial 
entrepreneurial community of women. So um, mentoring is, I see that as a little bit more passive, I don't know why, but it's important to have people to look up to and for you, role models are really important. Um, but I think the active thing of championing or sponsoring or even being a more active coach or advisor is a little bit more hands-on and willing to challenge. You know, you're not just a role model, you're really saying, tell me what you're dealing with and let me see how I can help. Right. I just got off a phone call for one of my advisees. She just raised the money. Great news, you know. Now she's freaking out about how to spend it. <laughs> they move to your next problem. Right? Yeah, it's like, <laughs> yeah. been there, done that. Right, right. You know? Well, it's good Good for helping them out. And, uh, and Fran, thanks for taking a few sure, minutes. Sure, a lot of fun. Absolutely. Track Fran down if you are a, a budding entrepreneur. She's, she's been there. She's got the scars and the wounds from the early days and, and learned from it on the success with Trustee. Thank you. And, and uh, some great videos on the web, by the way, that I was, I was watching. The whole story on the match thing was, was, was pretty funny. You'll enjoy it, so take There's a look. There's one of them where I start to cry, huh? I hate that I don't, one. What I didn't get to do? the crying part, but that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what, right. what happens yeah. in Jerry Maguire all the time. <laughs> all right, well, thanks a lot, Fran. Thanks so much. I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching theCUBE. We are in Phoenix, Arizona at the Girls uh, in Tech Catalyst Conference.